faculty uh, at uh, Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, um, where uh, I met Jan, I know it was about eight, eight years ago or so, uh, when we moved to Ames, uh, when my partner was started her PhD program, and was one of Jan's uh, um, advisees. And uh, Jan was always um, very supportive of both Ann and I. Appreciated all of this, all of this help of uh, those years. Um, Jan is um, uh, a rural sociologist. He is, an, I guess, internationalist, international man of mystery. He uh, has, does a lot of Latin American work, um, and he and his wife, uh, Neil Flora, um, have done a lot of um, a lot of foundational work in exploring the concept of social capital um, and uh, uh, within the uh, within rural sociology. Um, one of the, uh, the things Jan is working on now uh, and, and more recently is uh, Latino immigrant farmers, uh, Latino immigrant workers in food systems, uh, food related uh, industries. Uh, this talk today is entitled uh, fast and slow food, Latino immigrants' contributions to the Western food systems. Um, and I think that has uh, a, a growing relevance in political discourses about you know, immigration uh, in this country, uh, but also implications in terms of you know, economic situation and uh, environmental uh, issues associated with uh, food systems and so on. Um, and with that, <clears throat> you don't want to listen to me, you want to listen to Jan, so hand it over. Okay, is that better? Good. All right. Um, so then, and then uh, I want to talk just a little bit about the contributions of new immigrants to Iowa, but I think uh, the pattern is rather similar in Minnesota and Nebraska and other states as well. And then I want to present a case study of a local community in in Northwest Iowa that's just uh, one tier away from Minnesota uh, on how local politics uh, with respect to immigration uh, works on the ground. And then finally, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing on uh, uh, involving immigrants in local food value chains. So, uh, I encourage everybody to go to the uh, to the film Abused this afternoon because it's a wonderful film about Postville, Iowa. Uh, so I won't talk a lot about Postville. Uh, I just wanted to place the meatpacking business uh, in and and agriculture and immigrants in general into a historical context. And so what I did is drew this map timeline that has some of the uh, <coughs> immigrant labor force issues and, and critical uh, timeline times uh, that help us understand some of what has happened. And basically, uh, the pattern historically has been, and I'm 
unfortunately remains so, that um, immigrants, immigrant workers are welcome as long as the economy is doing well and there's a strong need for them. And then when the economy turns down, then uh, we get an awful lot of not only immigrant bashing, but some really uh, serious sorts of things have happened historically. And I just wanted to point out a couple. Um, one of the first groups to come to work in agriculture in the 19th century were the Chinese. And they also, after they worked in the agricultural sector, some of them were hired by the Southern Pacific Railroad to build the railroad through the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains in California and Nevada. And uh, they were hired partly because the existing <coughs> workers were not terribly, terribly reliable. They were uh, Northern European extraction and uh, had a tendency to uh, sometimes tip the bottle a bit the night before and wouldn't show up for work on time. But more importantly, uh, they often got dysentery. The conditions were not that great. And uh, uh, so uh, there was this race that was taking place, I'm sure you've all read it in your history books, between the Southern Pacific on the starting from California and the Union Pacific, which was starting uh, really from Iowa or uh, Nebraska, eastern Nebraska, and they were to meet, and the, whoever uh, built the most track then ended up with the greatest amount of land, uh, because uh, they, they were given land by the federal government in return for building the railroad. Uh, so it was really important to have good workers, and so one of the leaders of that uh, uh, the Southern Pacific decided, well, let's try Chinese. And it turned out the Chinese were excellent workers, partly because they drank tea rather than a hard liquor. <laughs> and that tea, most importantly, was boiled, and therefore they didn't get dysentery. Uh, but what's important, I think, is that when the two railroads met in Ogden, Utah, and they they uh, uh, drove the Golden State, and we had a transcontinental railroad. There were no Chinese at that ceremony. They were notably absent by design of the, of the people who organized it. And it was not much later then we had the Chinese exclusion law, which said that no more Chinese can come in. And so the Chinese were one of the first uh, groups of, of essentially illegal aliens. I don't usually use that term, but I'll, I'll use it for this moment. Uh, another element that I want to point out is, uh, does anybody know when, from your history books, when the Philippines got its independence from the U.S.? Yeah. 1946. 1946. That's what the history books say. And in fact, it, it's true, but in 1935, uh, or 1934, there was actually a law that was passed to uh, give the Philippines independence uh, 10 years hence. And it got, uh, because of World War II, it got delayed a little bit. But what was important about that law that we don't know about at all, we don't even know about the law, <laughs> was that there was also a provision in that law that only uh, 50 Filipinos per year could come from the Philippines to the US. So the 1930s, of course, was the Great Depression. So we had an economic downturn. So we decided to exclude any additional Filipinos from coming. And some Filipinos, uh, the, the, the 35 law also provided for repatriation of those, voluntary repatriation of those who wanted to go back. In other words, they got a, they got a boat uh, ticket to go back to the Philippines. Surprisingly, not very many people uh, took advantage of that. 
but what is particularly interesting about that is that then in 1942, and this is a little bit different kind of exclusion, uh, we had the Japanese internment. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was in, in 42. And uh, uh, most of the Japanese who were in the U.S. were U.S. citizens. And uh, there was never a single instance of espionage proven uh, with respect to Japanese Americans. Even in spite of that, they were put in internment camps. And what I found was really interesting was that the, uh, the Filipinos who were here were allowed to rent the land that the Japanese had vacated and essentially lost by being taken to the internment camps. So we do have a somewhat sordid history. And I think that we're repeating that history right now. OK. Uh, now I want to talk more specifically about the Midwest. And uh, um, <clears throat> so this shows uh, population change uh, in a graphic form uh, with respect to, uh, to Hispanic population. Anybody have any idea what those mountains are? What kinds of places are they? Yeah, the meatpacking communities. So, uh, uh, see, here's here's Iowa and here's Minnesota. We have some mountains there in southern Minnesota. This is a little bit old, so it has uh, it still has IBP, which is now Tyson, and uh, it has Swift, which is now JBS, which is a Brazilian firm. But uh, that. The mountains are still pretty much in the same place, although there are s smaller mountains that are growing up, uh, as I'll talk about later, with respect to uh, uh, other kinds of actual agricultural labor that Latinos are getting into in terms of confinement uh, operations. <clears throat> OK, so what was this meatpacking revolution that occurred? And it started in Denison, Iowa in 1960 with the founding of IBP. Uh, basically, we had most of the meatpacking operations in uh, metropolitan areas, uh, close to where the stockyards were. Most of you probably don't even know what stockyards are. The cattle were shipped to Chicago and uh, South St. Paul and Sioux City and, and so forth, and then they were slaughtered and, and uh, uh, processed uh, in the urban areas. So these two young guys had this idea that if you brought the packing plants to the cattle, to where the cattle were being raised, and this was following on to the feedlot uh, uh, growth that began in the 1950s, that you could save a lot of money in transport because you're essentially compacting the uh, the product and uh, and you don't have shrinkage of the animal and so forth. But probably more important, but probably less discussed, was the fact that by moving to rural areas, it was possible to. Uh, uh, find a population that was not as favorable to unions, and essentially that process of moving to rural areas became a union-busting activity. Uh, I mentioned, uh, indirectly mentioned, the box beef and the de-skilling of butchers. So those people who were working on the packing plant floor were also de-skilled, were de-skilled, but also those butchers who were located in your retail grocery stores. Uh, not only were de-skilled, but eventually completely eliminated. And then, uh, the because there were no one representing, well, let me put it this way, because there were no strong unions, in some cases there were still unions in the rural areas, uh, but they were not very strong. Uh, it was 
was possible to speed up the line, increase the repetitive motion uh, problems and, uh, and injuries and 